Hello, welcome to Literary Life and welcome to today's video where I'm going to share with you the books I am looking forward to specifically within Q1 of 2024 because there are a lot. As always, I will have links below if you're interested in purchasing a copy of any of these books. And if you plan to read them or if you already have, let me know your thoughts below. Now, if you're not familiar with my reading style, I do read a wide variety of genres. So as I move throughout the year, pretty much every genre should be represented in the books that are on my radar. I also wanted to ensure that this year I did read international authors. I did capture some translated works. So I just want to clarify, all of these books are published in 2024, but those that are translated may have been published in their language countries of origin a year, a few years ago, several years ago, but in 2024, they have been translated into English and therefore available for me to read. As always... Thank you for being a part of my literary life. Now, let's get rolling. So I'm going to cover these books in order of month. Nothing more specific than that. So we're going to start with the month of January. And one book for January, because I'm late in getting this video out, one book that came out in January, <laughs> I was able to grab and read. And that was Interesting Facts About Space by Emily Austin. So this is a contemporary fiction novel. And I had read the book by this author, Everyone in This Room Will Someday Be Dead. Absolutely loved this author's writing style. She is very witty. She does an amazing job at showing the reader what it is like to grow or to exist with anxiety in that particular book. In this book, we're going to have a neurodivergent character who also suffers from anxiety and was raised by a single mother who suffers from chronic depression. And our main character is in general successful. She has a career. She has a best friend. Uh, romantically, she dates. She does not sustain long-term relationships. And what's going to happen in this book is that her estranged father, who has been absent the majority of her life, will have passed away. And at his passing, he does um, leave her something in his will, which brings her into contact with her half-siblings. So we're going to see her journey in getting to know this family and also in reflecting on herself, on her relationship with her mother, on her childhood, and coming to terms with a lot of things that she experienced while growing up and had not really processed or even recalled clearly or correctly. Emily Austin, in my opinion, does an amazing job at taking very heavy and deep subjects, but covering them in a way that ca captures the complexity, but also brings a lot of humor. So your, in, your experience while reading her work, in my opinion, is just so incredibly engaging and eye-opening. Absolutely love her reading style. So that is the one book that was on my radar for January that I did manage to read so far. Now, the next book is contemporary fiction. It's called The Fetishist by Catherine Mean. This book is described as hilariously savage. So we've got a main character. She is a Japanese-American punk rock singer, and her name is Kyoko, and she is it has lost her mother, and she blames this man by the name of Daniel for her mother's death. Daniel broke her mother's heart. He is a philanderer. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what happened from the description, but my guess is he either cheated on her mom or ended the relationship. And I'm I'm concerned it led to her mom taking her own life, but that may be a misinterpretation. But either way, Kyoko blames Daniel for her mother's death. And she is enraged. She is full of grief. And she comes up with a plan to basically kidnap him and um, enact revenge. And in the act of doing so, uh, she is going to learn things about Daniel, about her mother. And I just found this whole concept incredibly intriguing. And oddly enough, I was intrigued by the fact that she was a punk rock singer. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how much that'll play into the story. So that is another book for January on my radar. Then I have a collection of horror short stories, Your Utopia, and that's by Bora Chung. 
So this is uh, going to be full of tales that cover loss, discovery, idealism, dystopia, de death, immortality. They, there is humor bedded in, but they are very unique plot lines. So for example, one is we're going to be in an apartment complex where the elevator is an AI elevator. It's going to fall in love with one of the people that live in the apartment complex. <laughs> The other example is we're going to be looking into capitalism's destruction um, of the planet through GMO companies. So again, just a wide range of kind of like they're definitely dystopian sci-fi, but there's humor embedded in there. So this collection of short stories did, did catch my atten attention and I want to read them. The last one for January is the book Come and Get It by Kylie Reed. So this author wrote Such a Fun Age, which you may have read. I did. Absolutely loved it. I think it was a five-star read for me. This is a contemporary fiction. So in this book, we're going to be in 2017 at the University of Arkansas. And basically, our main protagonist, Millie, she's a senior resident assistant. She basically just wants to graduate, get a job, buy a house. And she's going to meet a visiting professor and writer who's going to offer Millie a really unique opportunity. And Millie's going to jump at the chance uh, but then it's going to become, this hustle is going to become jeopardized by some new friendships she makes that are odd in nature, some dorm pranks that are vengeful. And all of this basically is going to address, you know, desire, consumption, reckless abandon, money, indiscretion, bad behavior. And knowing how much I enjoyed this author's writing before, this one, obviously, on my radar for this month. So hopefully I will get caught up and grab these few books I missed in January and get them read this year. All right, so let's move into February. We're going to start with a historical fiction novel by Kristen Hanna. I love, love her writing. And this is the book I'm sure many of you have heard of, The Woman. So here we're going to be back at the time of the Vietnam War. And our main character is Frankie. And she wants to be a part of the world, uh, war. The world is changing. She wants to um, assist in everything going on and follow in her brother's path who has shipped out to serve in Vietnam. So she joins the Army Nurse Corps. And we're going to basically follow her not just through her experience of the war, but we're going to meet a group of women involved in the war effort and get to know all of them, their experience, but also their experience when they return home. They're going to be returning home to a country that is very conflicted about the war and not just conflicted about the war, but some people hostile to those that were a part of the war effort and have returned home. So what is it like to go through the experience of having been in this war, exposed to extreme violence, loss, suffering, trauma, and then return home and have your your civil your your population, your people in your own country essentially attacking you in some cases literally attacking you. So I thought this would be a really interesting story to delve into both the woman's experience in the Vietnam War as well as that experience what it was like to return home to a hostile country. Then we're going to move into the nonfiction realm. We're going to look at a memoir I want to read called Private Equity. So this is going to focus on a woman who is going through a, a experience of self-discovery, and she is inside a top Wall Street firm. So she's uh, 29 years old, and she has left an analyst job. She leaves an MBA program, and she's in an unhappy engagement. So really at a point in life where it sounds like she's questioning everything. And she's going to get a rare opportunity to work at this one of the most prestigious hedge funds in the world, and she'll be the sole assistant to the firm's billionaire founder. And so we're going to learn about that world, what it is like to work in that type of environment. But she's also going to share with us how physically and mentally draining and deteriorating this experience was. And she's going to showcase for us that struggle between um, for balance when you're in a world of efficiencies, excess, status, power, 
um, an extreme fortune. So I was really intrigued both to get a glimpse into that industry as well as into the fact that she had a unique role, it sounds like, not being familiar with that industry myself. And then, of course, a woman's experience in an industry, which I'm assuming was at the time, if not still, male-dominated. That could be a wrong assumption. But I always love hearing when people are um, in the minority, you know, what that experience is like as well. Still in February, there is a literary fiction book called Leaving by Roxana Robinson that I am looking forward to. This is going to be a difficult read for me, though, I think, and I think for a lot of people, and because it's going to cover a heavy and uh, a topic that I think can bring a lot of debate around it, and that is going to be infidelity. So we're going to have a college couple that have, you know, a love affair and something leads to their breaking up. And years later, perhaps even a decade later, they're going to um, cross paths again. And in that reunion, their feelings for each other are going to still be very much alive and well. Now, I believe she is at that point divorced, I think also has a child. He is still married with a child or children. And they are going to uh, make the decision to have an affair. And that affair is going to obviously uh, feed the ongoing um, attraction and romance between them. And they're going to essentially be con conflicted because he is struggling with ending his marriage. And I, I know this is a incredibly a common occurrence. It's probably almost cliche, but this book is going to delve into like the emotional experience and I think intellectual experience um, in that component. I'm curious and hopeful that it's also going to delve into the dynamics of an affair in the course of a troubled marriage, the impact on the marriage avoidance, you know, more of the psychology of that type of relationship. I don't know that it does. That's something I'm hoping for. But at the least, I was intrigued by the fact of the complexity of that situation and emotional experience. So literary fiction book called Leaving on my radar as well. The next book is The Book of Love. This is a fantasy book by Kelly Link. So in this book, we're going to have three high school friends, Laura, Daniel, and Mo, and they're essentially going to have disappeared. I was going to say suddenly, but I'm pretty sure that's always how a disappearance happens. But then they're going to suddenly reappear in their college classroom. I think it's like a year after their disappearance. And when they reappear in their, um, not, I said college, but it's high school classroom. When they reappear in their classroom, a music teacher is also going to be present. And this music teacher has uh, an involvement in the situation that led to their disappearance and led to their reappearance. We don't know what it is. Um, but what the music teacher is going to tell them, they're essentially, they are dead, but they can return to their families and homes and they have a series of tasks activities that they have to complete. They can't tell anyone where they've been. But the kicker is once they complete all these tasks, all three of them aren't going to be okay, so to speak. There will be winners and there will be losers. So it sounds like almost a competition between the three of them is being um, created. I don't know if it's so that they can come back to life. I I'm not sure exactly what the nature of it is, but this was such a unique plot. Um, I was immediately intrigued. And so that book, The Book of Love, on my radar. Now, the next book of uh, the book for February is a horror book called Among the Living by Tim Lieben. And this book is going to look at two estranged friends, Dean and Bethan, that meet each other after they've been apart for five years. And they have very distinctly different, morally different jobs. Dean works for a corporation that basically exploits rare earth minerals. So they're in there just digging stuff up, right, for profit. Where Bethan is an environmental activist. They're going to be on a remote Arctic island and Dean's company's activity of digging stuff up is going to unleash something horrific and these friends are going to end up having to work together to survive because they're going to be facing not just 
the threats from the environment, the physical, the extreme weather of the Arctic island, but also the threats from this horrific thing that has um, been unleashed due to being uncovered from uh, the company's digging. So I was intrigued by a couple different things. One, a story on an Arctic island, that extreme weather component um, for survival, very interested in that. And then weaving in the, you know, the horror element where they basically, you know, it's just horror. It's just a fun kind of play um, getting away from reality there. So that one on my radar as well. Then I had a really unique story I came across that I was immediately intrigued by called Ours by Philip B. Williams. This is historical fiction and fantasy blended together. I love like genre plays and blends like that. So this is set in America in the mid 19th century. And we're going to have this woman um, who is essentially her. She's named Saint. But she is a conjurer, and it's the 1830s, and she is going to go all over Arkansas and just annihilate plantations and rescue the people that are enslaved. So as soon as I read that, I was like, that is so cool. I mean, how amazing if that actually had was able to happen, right, you know, at that time. I love the idea of, like, that superhero, you know, coming in when people are um, in horrific situations being victimized and rescuing them from that. So once she frees these people, she has a haven, um, a town that is magically concealed from outsiders that are referred to as ours. So she's going to bring all of them to her magical safety zone. And over time, though, what's going to happen is that ours, those outsiders are going to threaten and um, expose the community's safety and uh, they're basically going to have to uh, fight again for their uh, their safety and freedom. So I was, like I said, completely intrigued by the setting, the time period, and then this fantasy play on that um, and that superhero component. Then I have a book. It's contemporary literature that was transla- translated from the French called About Uncle by Rebecca Gisler. So this book is about a woman, um, young woman, who finds herself moving to a small town that's on the seaside to care for an uncle who is a disabled veteran. And it sounds like this uncle has a lot of um, issues, uh, pro- I'm, I'm going to assume probably tied to his um, disability and to what he experienced uh, when he was in the war. But he drinks, you know, he gorges, he hoards. And uh, he does some occasional excursions down plumbing, which I had no idea what that meant, but I'm very curious to find out. So we have like a really difficult situation she finds herself in because this is not the future she wanted for herself. But through this being together and caretaking role, there's an attachment that's going to form between them. And then what's going to happen is the uncle's health is going to take a final turn for the worse where he's sent to a hospital And uh, she's then going to have to cope with, I think, that loss and just this new reality, this new sense of life she has found herself in. That is it for February, final month of March. A mystery called The Hunter by Tanya French. I love her books. And so definitely had this one on my radar So in this particular one, we're going to be in a village on Western Ireland, and we have a family. Uh, The man, Kel Hooper, um, had retired early from the Chicago Police Department, moved to this remote or quieter village just to have a quieter and calmer life. And he meets a woman, Lena. They get married. And uh, or he's built a relationship. I'm not sure if they're married with her, but she has a teenage son called Trey, who's described as uh, a good kid that's going in good places. But what's going to happen are two men are going to arrive to at the village. One of them is Trey's long gone father and the other one is a billionaire. They're basically there. They have a scheme to find gold in that area. And their arrival is going to trigger not just a conflict for Trey and a change, it sounds like, in his behavior, um, but also set off a chain of events um, that are going to bring the mystery um, 
to life. And then it's also got a revenge component and um, the sense of like, what would we do for those that we love? So again, I, I almost didn't even need to read the description as soon as I saw Tanya French had another book. I was like, yes, I want to read that. Then another nonfiction memoir that's oddly very similar because it's also going to touch on the finance industry. And this one's called The Trading Game, A Confession by Gary Stevenson. So in this book, we have um, a man who, you know, is going to take us into the trading floor and uh, showcase not just his own journey there, but that industry um, as well. And he basically grew up, it sounds like poorer, and I could be wrong in that, in East London, um, but he arrives at the London School of Economics, and he doesn't fit in with the general, like, posh kind of um, style of his classmates. You know, he's wearing track suits and sneakers, and what's going to happen is he's unexpectedly going to win, I guess, a big competition there called the Trading Game, and by winning this, he's going to essentially get an opportunity to become a trader for Citibank. And I don't know if he is the youngest at that time or one of the youngest traders, but a really remarkable and unique opportunity. And at some point, you know, through being in that industry, you know, we're going to come to 2008 when we had the big global financial crisis. And so we're going to see, you know, from his lens, he's in the industry and he's in a situation where you essentially can make millions by betting against people that are going to become poor, which is exactly what happened. And so we're going to see, I, I think he's going to take us on like the moral conflict that he experienced with that. So I personally, remembering that time and my feelings in general, um, about what happened with that industry. I I think this is going to be a difficult read, but I'm definitely intrigued in, in learning a little bit more and understanding a little bit more about what went on, but also about his personal experience in that as well. Then we're going to go into a thriller book by called Murder Robe by Simone St. James. Now, I have read I think all of her other books and I either loved or really liked all of them. And so this particular one, we have a young couple who is going to find themselves connected to a string of gruesome murders. So they're basically, it's 1995, they, they're on a trip, they've taken a wrong turn, and um, they're trying to get out to this resort, small resort town where they're spending their um, honeymoon, and they see a female hitchhiker that they pick up. And once she's in their vehicle, they see that she is horrifically bleeding from underneath her coat. And so they take her to a hospital where she dies. This is going to get her pulled into the police investigation around this hitchhiker's death, but also around the fact that there have been a string of murders along this road and they're now suspect or getting pulled in on the police's radar. So this couple is going to decide to investigate what's been going on on this murder road um, to essentially clear their names. But there is, as it is Simone St. James, if you're not familiar with their writing, there is a supernatural component woven into this story. And I've really enjoyed how that is brought to life in her fiction um, so definitely another book I'm excited for in March. Then we're going to go into some African literature. This is also contemporary literature called Parasol Against the Axe by Helen Oyeme. I'm probably mispronouncing that and apologize if so. So in this story, our main character is going to have um, end up in Prague. She's going for an estranged friend's bachelorette weekend. Um, and... It's interesting, you know, that she decides to go, but once she's there, she's going to have a series of very odd and unusual experiences. Um, there's going to be people from her past and present that are just repeatedly popping up. You know, it'd be one thing you run into a person or two and you're like, no way, you know, here I am out of my usual zone and we're, you're running into people, but she's going to run into people frequently where it's going to become quite unusual. And then we're going to have uninvited companions that show up to participate at the bachelorette activities um, that are going to bring, a, it sounds like a, a, 
a wider range of both positive and negative experiences to the weekend. And then there's going to be one person in particular that shows up and it's really going to bring up the tensions between um, our protagonist and her estranged friend who are, who's getting married that the Bachelorette Weekend is for. So it's like this, it's just like the series of relationships and oddities that are all rolled into one and almost had like a mystical quality to it. Um, so I was really intrigued by that being woven in with the relationship dynamics, which if you follow my channel, you know I'm a huge fan of. Then we're going to go into a thriller called Finding Sophie by Imran Mahmood. So this particular book, we have a 17-year-old daughter of Harry and Zara, or Zara, who leaves the house one day and then just disappears. And the, the parents are, of course, like devastated, um, trying to understand what happened to their daughter. And there are two components that really drew me to the way this story is laid out. One is that we're going to shift between Harry's perspective and Zara's perspective, so the mom and dad's perspectives, and we're going to cover two points in time. We're going to follow them through the weeks immediately following their daughter's disappearance as they try to grapple with it and start to uncover and learn things about their daughter and her life um, to a year later. Then we'll jump to a year later in the course of a murder trial. We don't know who's been murdered from the description, but we'll be there in the murder trial and also continuing to experience their uncovering about their daughter and who she was. So I was really intrigued by that perspective play as well as the timeline shifts there for that thriller. Then there was a novel, Change, by Edward Louise. This is literary fiction that is actually based, though, on events of the author real life. So it's an autobiographical fiction that is translated from the French. So basically, this is a person who, um, it sounds like as he was growing up, was not satisfied with his social class and situation in life and made a purposeful, conscious change to change it, <laughs> decision to change it. How he did this, though, is really intriguing to me. And again, I'm not sure exactly how much of this is the nonfiction versus the fiction point, um, but the character of him in the book um, wants to get beyond poverty, beyond discrimination and the violence of his working class hometown. So he heads to Paris. And when he does so, he basically sheds his identity, gets a new name and is going to just completely remove every aspect of who he was and he's going to start to surround himself with the people that I think he wants to learn from, emulate, and that we're going to see him with people like aristocrats, millionaires, and drug dealers. <laughs> and everything he's doing, every decision, motivated to become someone else than who he has been. So i incredibly intrigued, cannot wait to read that book as well. Then I have a horror fantasy book that was translated from the Spanish called Thirst by Romina Yuzchuk, and I'm totally butchering that, I am sure, and apologize. As always, if you follow my channel, you know I mispronounce things constantly. Um, here we're going to be in the 19th century and modern times, and our main one of our main protagonists is a vampire, and we're going to see her go from Europe to Buenos Aires, and um, she's going to have been here before, but this so this is her second time there. And she's going to basically, um, due to living, you know, forever, um, watch it go from a village to a cosmopolitan city, see the yellow fever come through and impact the lives there. And she's going to very much be learning how to intermingle with humans, um, but yet be discreet about the nature of who she is. And we're going to follow her then into present day Buenos Aires, where her she's going to cross paths with a human woman um, and who's this woman is in the losing her mom to illness, um, terminal illness. And she's really um, struggling with that loss and um, her own relationship and identity with herself as a mother. So these, their vampire and this human protagonist paths are going to cross. And it sounds like a relationship between them is going to um, f develop 
And I just thought that was really intriguing. (laughs) And then I have a book that is fiction, speculative fiction, called 2054 by Elliot Ackerman. Now, apparently he wrote a book called 2034. I, I have not read. So I also added that one to my want to read list. This is going to take us um, to a time when artificial intelligence has combined with our political structure, um, our intelligence community, and uh, basically has gotten to the point where it is full out creating an existential threat to our country. So what's going to happen is the president is going to die, essentially be assassinated. AI is going to have a play in that. So the investigating agency is going to reach out to a tech guru who really can has the knowledge, the understanding of AI and can help them um, address this threat. And in particular, outside of the fact that I am intrigued and simultaneously horrified, but intrigued with AI. It's just, it's definitely um, an interesting uh, thing that is evolving. Uh, So outside of the the book covering that, it also is going to cover biotech. So I was really um, drawn to that component. And then it's very geopolitical as well, which is another thing that interested me. Then in March, I don't know. I'm, I don't. I just hope I can read like most of these. Annie Bot, a sci-fi book by Sierra Greer. So here we're going to have another AI female robot who has been created for a human owner, basically to be the ideal go- girlfriend in all ways. And her programming, you know, is very much your your. It's AI programming, but. The owner, Doug, is going to tell her that um, what he one of the things he loves about her is that she seems so human. Right. She seems so like a real human woman. And she from this conversation is going to really delve into, well, what does it mean to be a human woman? How can I be more of this for him? And in doing so, she, you know, being human means being less perfect. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, desire, curiosity, secrecy, longing. And so she's going to really, um, in the act of trying to become more of what Doug wants or seem to value, become less of what he values, essentially. And I was so intrigued by that because I think this experience um, with AI of being anything being personalized, right? Immediate gratification. They're not being the experience of having to um, not get everything I want or not having a perfect relationship. Um, You know, that that delving into that, I think, is going to be a really great um, part of the story that I'm looking forward to. Okay, Grayson's totally joining. So the next book is a literary fiction book called Memory Peace by Lisa Ko. So this book is going to follow three friends over decades. And I absolutely love books that look at friendships traversing time. So in the, we're going to begin in the early 1980s with Giselle, Jackie, and Ellen. And they're initially going to be drawn together and become friends because they have this sheer, shared sense of alienation and they each want to be different. And as they grow up, their lives are going to lead them into three very different careers. One is a performance artist, one is a coder, and one is a community activist. But they're going to maintain their friendship and it's going to mature. It's going to change. Um, And this book is going to take us through that friendship from the 1980s to the 1990s, all the way into the future of even now into the 2040s. So completely love that, you know, watching relationships and time evolve and mature. And I'm also curious to see what the author does with the future, the 2040s, and what that will look like in this book. Um, So that is Memory Peace. Then we're going to go into a gothic horror book called Diavola by Jennifer Marie 
thorn. So this book, we have a family that decides to take a vacation to a villa, and the villa is essentially going to be haunted. So this is like a twist on a haunted house. So they're at this go gorgeous and remote villa, and they're trying to, you know, basically endure all this togetherness of being um, a family, you know, in a remote location together. And they're not just going to be dealing with the dynamics of each other, but the villa, the haunting element that's going on, the strange noises at night. Then they're going to hear from the local villagers um, some unsettling warnings. And then they're going to find out that the villa has a, a dark past that is violent as well. So I loved that like family dynamics blended with like haunted, um, haunted location. So I was excited to read this one. And the final book on my March list is You'd Look Better as a Ghost by Joanna Wallace. This is a thriller mystery. And this one does have some humor woven into it. So we're going to be looking at um, our main character, Claire, who is a part time serial killer. <laughs> this is a hobby of hers. And essentially what's going to go on is that she is going to be tracking her next victim at a bar. And as she is doing so, there is someone who is actually tracking her and that person is going to begin blackmailing her. So she is going to, to you know, protect this violent hobby she has um, from coming out and being public information, she is going to start to try to uh, track down her blackmailer while juggling things like her weekly bereavement support group because her father has just passed. And uh, she's also trying to get her art career off the ground. So again, just this play, you know, we've got that mystery and thriller, but embedded, it sounds like, with a lot of humor. Um, so You Look Better as a Ghost, the final book on my March want to read list. So that is my plan for Q1. We'll see how much of it I get to. Um, I will have a video out for what I plan to target in Q2 um, before Q2 begins. So I'll get that one. Hopefully I sh I'll target March up for you all. Um, but do drop below the books that you're interested in reading for Q1 because you know, not that I have room to add more, but I'll at least add them to my list if I ha hadn't already looked at them and they grab my attention. Because, you know, I can a to read list ever get too long? <laughs> okay, that's probably why I have this many books to read in my office. All right. Thank you, as always, for watching and being a part of my literary life now. Let's go read some books. Happy reading.